Well, thank you so much, Pastor, and I've been greatly anticipating tonight, and I've been looking forward to opening God's Word and studying the Christmas story from the Gospel of John is where we're going to be tonight, the Gospel of John. And I had to retrain myself on how to tie this tie tonight, and uh, Pastor, uh, you you, uh, observed that, yes, I am wearing a tie. Last week, I was actually wearing a mullet because my class had a redneck Christmas party last week, so I looked a lot different last Wednesday, but it's good to be here in the main worship center with you here in, on this Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night. Now, this certainly is one of the most uh, wonderful times of the year. I enjoy the Christmas season for a variety of uh, uh, ways and reasons, some of them being because you're starting to see Christmas lights go up on homes, you're seeing Christmas lights go up on trees. I think we've got a slide of some of my favorite things. Of course, the peppermint milkshake is at Chick-fil-A right now, and if you have not had one of those peppermint milkshakes, uh, I won't tell you how many of I have already had this holiday season. But uh, of course, Christmas caroling, extra gathering around this time of year, It's certainly a wonderful time of the year. My family and I were shopping earlier this week. I had dropped Gloria off at Costco. She was going to do some Christmas shopping. Jane and I went down to Target, and I had forgotten how much I hate shopping. That is for sure. I I thoroughly did not enjoy it. I told Jane, Jane, I really don't like shopping. The best part is just spending time with you. And she was kind of understanding. And we did not have a clearly defined list. Now, for me, shopping's fun for like grocery shopping. Give me a clearly defined list. You walk into the store, you get what you want, maybe pick up a few maybe other desires along the way and you leave. I've told my wife, If you don't have a list, you shouldn't be in a store. You need to go in, get what you need, and then get out of there. But on Monday night this week, I walked into the store, remembered how much I disliked shopping. We were looking for a toy for Paisley. That really communicates in the way of, I need something to also play with. If I'm gonna get it for Paisley, ultimately on Christmas morning, I'm gonna be involved playing with that toy as well. But when we think of this time of year, there's a multitude of things that our minds go to. Extra shopping, extra family time, maybe extra time off of work. Now, I will say that when I was shopping with Paisley earlier this week, it wasn't in vain completely. I was able to at least get one thing off of my list for Gloria. It is something that she asked me for. It was something that was on her list And that was the luxurious item of a laundry basket, okay? And you might be thinking right now to yourself, how could you? You're like the worst gift giver ever. And because I'm so thoughtless, or, or thoughtful rather, it was one of the nicer laundry baskets. But I certainly need some extra help during this time of year. I, I struggle with getting just the right gift. Now, I would imagine that there would be someone here tonight that maybe would still be searching for just the right gift for maybe a friend, maybe a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a coworker. Many of us were 11 days away from Christmas. Many of us maybe have not completed our Christmas shopping yet. But there is a present that God has specifically for each and every single one of us that he really wants us to have this Christmas season. Now, there might be somebody here that has maybe never made the personal decision to receive Jesus Christ. Well, this message is for you. But there also might be a believer that has forgotten about the true meaning of Christmas. And this message is also for you here from the Gospel of John, the present of his presence. Now, there is no substitute for his presence. There's no substitute. Have you ever done your Walmart pickup order and they substitute items? Okay, I wanted the Captain Crunch, but they didn't have it, so they substituted it for like the Berry Colossal, a different type of cereal. It's definitely not the same, but they substituted it. We were in Costco the other day, and my wife said, they're out of eggs. Well, I don't need eggs. I can substitute that with flaxseed. I didn't even know that you could eat flaxseed, but apparently you can substitute it when you need eggs. Substitutes. There's no substitute for God's presence. But all the time, we look for substitutes, maybe comfortable living, everything that we would need, or popularity, all the connections that we would need. But there's nothing that can substitute this present that Jesus gives to us. 
Now place your thinking caps on before we read these few verses here from the Gospel of John. I need you to drift with me back about a little over 2,000 years ago. And everyone's got to place their thinking caps on because this is going to be, I think, a message that is going to help us theologically as we prepare for the Christmas season. What would the Christmas story be without the shepherds, without the nativity, without the manger, without Joseph, without Mary, without Bethlehem, without the wise men, without the baby? What would it be? It would be the exact account that John gives us here in verse number one. Notice this in John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was, was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not." But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 14 verses, no Joseph, no Mary, no Bethlehem, no wise men, no baby. And here we see the Christmas story in a simple five words. The word was made flesh. Not because of the physical features of the stable or of the manger. Not because the wise men eventually did make their way to worship Jesus. Not because of a young couple or even the shepherds that came to worship not because, and, and they were all there. That's a historical fact, and certainly what a sight that would have been to see. But the real story is that the Word became flesh. Now, I want you to study with me tonight the promise of His presence. The promise of His presence. We notice this in verse number 14, where the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh. And let me point your attention. That is a capital W word. That's the infinite becoming finite. That's the eternal one entering into time. That is the invisible becoming visible for us to see. John writes this gospel to get that truth across. The truth that Jesus is God in human flesh. Now, of course, we know this to be the fulfillment of prophecy. This was not a man that was working to become God. This was rather Almighty God becoming man. This was, of course, promised from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, we could read about the coming Christ or the Messiah. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Of course, it's spoken of in Psalm chapter 89. How David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and uphold thy throne to all generations. The person of Christ is beautifully prophesied in the book of Isaiah multiple times, but one of my favorite Christmas passages. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the promise of his presence, the fulfillment of prophecy. This is God in the flesh for us. And even the place was prophesied. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The prophecy fulfilled here that God became flesh. But notice here, in survey with me, the deity of Jesus. The deity of Jesus. Now, we read 14 verses here at the beginning, John chapter 1. Why couldn't verse number 1, why didn't John write, in the beginning was Christ? In the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the Lord. Why did John choose the Greek word logos? Well, I think there's a significant reason behind why he chose the word. Behind the word, the Greek word logos, of course, this was going to be speaking to both the Jew and the Gentile. Now, this is vital for us to understand, and it blows my mind when I was studying this passage. And I truly believe that this passage, you could study it for all of eternity because it really deals with the eternal one. The Greeks would have read this verse that John penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they would have completely understood what John was communicating. When John said logos, in the Greek world of philosophy and religion, they would have understood that to be the creative force, the intelligent mind of the universe. The logos is not just a floating principle of reason. This was the most powerful force in the universe. To the Greek mind, the Logos was incredibly powerful, and John understood that. This was meaning the creative power. This was the source of wisdom. This was knowledge and intelligence. And when John is saying that this is a person, and this person who is Almighty God became flesh and dwelt among us, this is more than just a person. This is the person. This is God becoming flesh. But to the Jew, it would even have extra meaning. If you've read in the Old Testament, and I could give you many examples here uh, this evening. Genesis 15, 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1 Kings chapter 6. uh, The Old Testament is full of the saying, the word of the Lord came. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord was the expression of the personal God, the true and living God of the Old Testament. And John is now saying that the word is now coming and God is now incarnate. So the word is God, is what he's saying here in John chapter 1. And when he's saying this to the Jew, this is now God in the flesh. The word was not an abstract concept of philosophy. This was a real person who came to dwell with us. This is a real person who could be seen, who could be touched, who could be heard. He is the word of the living God. And he uses that term because it covers both the Gentiles, and the Jews. Isn't that amazing there in verse number 14? And the word was made flesh. Now God took on the fullness of humanity while remaining 100% God. Uh, Charles Wesley's wonderful hymn, Hark the Angels Sing. Of course, we're very familiar with that hymn. I love the line where it says, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity, Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And of course, this deity of Jesus Christ is very clearly taught here. And if that wasn't enough already, I placed three different boxes there in your notes that communicates the deity of Christ to the next level. Jesus, of course, has titles that only belong to God. Jesus possessed characteristics that only belong to God. Jesus did works that only God could do because Jesus is God. 
The evidence of the deity of Jesus Christ, it really fills the scriptures. You could read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, of course, Emmanuel, God with us, the fulfillment of prophecy. Luke chapter 2, you can read about the birth of Jesus Christ. And those are wonderful passages, but I believe the most powerful uh, verse Opening the Gospel of John is communicating here the Christmas story in verse number 14. The Word was made flesh. Simple enough for a child to understand, but so deep to the point where the wisest man has a hard time understanding the depth of the truth here in verse number 14. Uh, this, this one point here is an encouragement to me. The promise of His presence and you can take God's promises to the bank. And I'm thankful that here tonight we can rest in, assur in assurance that God did come. But I want you to notice secondly with me the purpose of his presence. Now, it's one thing to study the Bible for knowledge and for information. But why? Why did God come to this broken planet? Why would he want to come? You know, a recent convert here at Lancaster Baptist Church, he was walking through lesson three recently of continued discipleship. And let me encourage you with the continued discipleship. If there's someone here that's never done discipleship, you're missing out. It's an amazing study. Let me encourage you to even speak with me right after church if you've never done discipleship. But he's going through and he's asking amazing questions. He's, uh, he's a great thinker. He's quite deep in his questions. And he had a question for me on Monday of this week. He said, Jacob, does the word, he was saying capital W word, does the word appear in the Old Testament? And I was starting to get so excited. I, oh, I could not wait to answer his question. And I said, okay, you got to take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14. Isaiah chapter 7, of course, is a very familiar passage with us where it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then I said, okay, Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 23. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, shall be with child and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In John chapter 1 and verse number 14, I think is where my Bible was. And I said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is one of my favorite names for who God is. He came to be our personal Savior, a personal God. And I want you to take a moment with me here this evening and be reminded of the purpose of his presence. It wasn't just promised, but there was a purpose behind the promise. He came to dwell with us. And I get so humbled when I read verse number 14 and, and am reminded of why he came. Notice that in verse number 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What I see here is the humility to come. The humility to come. Galatians chapter 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. You know, when we plan a trip, when we maybe book a vacation, we call ahead, we make a reservation, we call the hotel, we look for an Airbnb, we make sure that it's available and that we're going to have a place to stay. Well, Almighty God, who owns everything, but there was no place. There was no place for him. John chapter 1 and verse 11, just a few verses up, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me, but in Bethlehem's home was there found no room. I'm reminded here in this passage of the humility of Christ to come. But also I see the humility to serve. The humility to serve. 
Of course, Mark chapter 10 tells us very clearly, For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And He came to give us an example. Jesus, the Word, became flesh, and He dwelt among us to give us a beautiful example for us to pattern our own lives around. Philippians 2 is one of my favorite passages on that. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The humility to come. Would you want to come here when you're leaving almighty heaven, beautiful place called heaven? But the humility to come to our broken world. The humility not to come to be necessarily served, but rather to give us an example to serve. He dwelt among us. He did life with us, and he gave us an example. Heaven's arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal decree. But of a lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility. The humility to come, the humility to serve, but also the humility to save. If you notice that in verse number 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John tells us in verse number 17 of chapter 1 that the law came with Moses, by Moses. The law condemns us. But that same verse in verse number 17, if you want to see it for yourselves, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. God provided a way of restoration. Of course, we would read later on, he is the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And that's the Christmas story, according to John, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, the humility to come, the humility to serve and the humility to save us. Hebrews chapter two and verse nine says it beautifully for us. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word, that thou shalt set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor. May our prayer here tonight, whether we're saved and need to be reminded of the true meaning of Christmas or whether we're unsaved, needing to receive the greatest gift, the present of his presence. May our prayer tonight be, oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room for thee. John wants us to know that the Christmas story, this is, this is it right here. God became flesh and dwelt among us. The promise of his presence, that was the fulfillment of prophecy that proves his deity. My, I'm, I'm amazed at the promises of God's word and how they are a reality for us to study here tonight. But then the purpose of his presence, that was for God to provide us a way to the Father. But ultimately here tonight, it's been mainly just knowledge tonight. What does this mean for me tomorrow? This is a wonderful study on the deity of Christ, but when it comes to application, as our pastor always teaches us, your belief ought to affect your behavior. And now I truly believe John here in verse number 14 gives us a healthy practice here at the Christmas time. The practice in his presence. Of course, verse 14, as we're being very familiar with that verse here tonight, says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But I believe this is the practice that we need to be reminded of this Christmas season. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That word beheld just amazes me. Take your Bible, if you don't mind, and turn over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 1 and 2. John here is saying, I am a witness 
of God's glory. We beheld his glory. John is saying here, I saw it with my very own eyes. Verse number one in 1 John chapter one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. Aren't you thankful that our God's a personal God? That we're not bowing to a stone or to some type of idol. But John is saying right here in the epistle of John, no, we've seen him with our eyes. We've looked upon him in our, in our hands, have handled him. He's a real God, not just a rock or stone God, but a real person of the word of life. Verse 2, 1 John chapter 1, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which with the Father was manifested unto us. John is teaching us here, I am a eyewitness of God walking on this planet. That not only just strengthens my faith. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, this prophecy is not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is just another evidence that we have the truth that God walked on this planet and that the word was made flesh. John's telling us, I saw him, I touched him, I heard him. And what John is teaching us here in chapter 1 and verse number 14, he's saying, I beheld his glory. I focused attentively. Let me encourage you during this Christmas season to focus attentively on the Word of God. Like a medical intern that may observe a general surgeon that's practicing that medical intern is going to be watching everything attentively because he's trying to learn and observe. This time of year, I think Pastor shared it in his message just recently about how companies spend billions of dollars during this time of year. Your workplace and, of course, our so social media and electronics, they're begging for our attention, are they not, here in the month of December. But let me encourage you to focus attentively on the Word. The original birthday celebration of our king sometimes gets smothered underneath the decorations and the merrymaking. And ultimately, in the, in the sense of a busy season, sometimes we forget the ultimate reason behind the season, and that is the word became flesh. May this Christmas we be reminded of the glory of God. And now John teaches us that this will ultimately lead into a funneled energy. Now this focus ought to change the way that we view tomorrow, of how we view the present. God's presence ought to have an effect on us right now. When John's teaching us here in verse number 14, we beheld his glory as of, of the only begotten of the Father, the glory of God ought to change the way that we live. Now, energy without focus can oftentimes cause destruction. And I'm reminded of my three-year-old right there. I mean, energy without focus can often cause destruction. I mean, Jane's just full of energy. And oftentimes uh, our home needs to be clean about five or six times a day because she's just having a good time without any focus. But let me encourage you with your, uh, your focus on Christ. As John said, I focused, I was attentive, and I beheld his glory. I truly believe that a heart that is fully focused on the glory of God will really be reflected in a daily living for Jesus day by day in your daily actions. A funneled energy. Is not that what Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 18? But we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now the promise of His presence. Aren't you thankful for the promises of God and how He came to us? The Word was made flesh. But then the purpose of His presence Aren't you thankful that it wasn't just a promise, but that he came for each and every single one of us? 
He came to dwell with us, to give us an example, to know what it's like, not just by omniscient knowledge, but by experience, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. He knows exactly what we're going through this time of year. He knows exactly what it's like to live on this planet. The humility behind that, that Almighty God would love me enough to come and dwell with me. And he dwelt among us. That was the purpose. But what does that look like in our practice? Let me encourage you this Christmas season to be reminded of the greatest present of all. Now, I've got my wife more than just a laundry basket, okay? I've got her some great gifts, and I'm excited for her to open those. And uh, honestly, the, the, the next 11 days are going to be hard not to tell her what I have ordered and gotten. She's going to be quite surprised. But more important than all the gifts that will be under the tree on December the 25th, the present of his presence and being reminded underneath all of the decorations and merrymaking that ultimately behind the Christmas season is that Almighty God came to us and dwelt among us. And yes, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. According to John, he didn't need Bethlehem, although it was a historical place and a prophesied place. He didn't need the shepherds. He didn't need the manger, as sometimes we characterize the, the season. Sometimes our culture characterizes the season like I started with. Oh, the peppermint milkshake, the, the lights on the trees and the houses. And from the world's perception, it just looks a little bit different and maybe a, a few extra fun things during this time of year. But for the Christian, it means something so much more. It means that God loves us and became flesh. Lots of people believe in a manger. And I would imagine that we could go to Walmart tonight and somewhere in Walmart find a shepherd or a manger or some type of nativity somewhere on the shelves, I would imagine. There's people that believe in a place called Bethlehem. There's people that believe in the shepherds and wise men. But the question tonight, do we really believe that God became flesh? And let me encourage you, fellow Christian, let me encourage you, maybe still searching for the answers, that God did become flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The promise of his presence, the purpose of his presence. And let me encourage you this Christmas season to practice in his presence, focusing on his glory and allowing that to change the outlook of your day and changing tomorrow because we're so focused on the true meaning behind Christmas. John gives us at the end of his book, John chapter 20 and verse 31, a helpful verse that I hope will be a blessing to you as we close. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name.